Amen. All right. Uh, Peter is a unique <laughs> character. And because he is mentioned most, yeah, go ahead and come right ahead. Uh, because he's mentioned more, that's why I'm spending a little bit more time on Peter, because he, I think he's a good example for us. And, and you say, well, Peter messed up a lot. Well, you'll see that this morning, but, uh, but I think he is a good example um, so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to look at Peter three, in three stages uh, this morning. Peter, before his call to be an apostle, uh, what was he like then? And then we're going to look at his, from his call to the ascension. That's during the time of Christ when, uh, he was, when the Lord was ministering to him there. And then we're going to look at him uh, from Jesus' ascension then until his particular death. So let's get in this this morning here. Peter, before his call to be an apostle, uh, he was born Simon Bar Jonah. That means the Simon is his name. Bar Jonah means of Jonah or son of Jonah. Uh, and both Peter and Andrew, his brother, were fishermen. Uh, we know that by all the different scriptures. Uh, we know that Peter had a wife uh, because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. I promised I would not make any mother-in-law jokes. Uh, my mother-in-law, when she was alive, I loved her. But Katie barred the door when it was time to get together because we would mother-in-law and son-in-law jokes all over the place. Uh, and she was a good sport about it. And she matched most of the jokes, too. Uh, it seems initially that Peter and Andrew were partners uh, in a fishing business. And this is important because you'll notice that later on he goes back to that fishing business. Uh, but he was in business with James and John, the sons of Zebedee, uh, and up there on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you find that in Luke 5, verse 10. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. It's not something I'm making up. It's actually in the Word of God. They were partners. Uh, and there's several passages you could go to. Notice Peter was brought to Christ by Andrew, uh, his brother. Now, I want to I wanna just stop here a minute. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 1. Uh, there's several things that I, that I want you to see here. John chapter 1 and verse 40 through 42. It says, One of the two which heard John speak followed him, fo and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, uh, that thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So he was brought to Christ by his brother Andrew. And I hear people all the time talking about soul winning, uh, being an Andrew. Uh, Peter was already saved. Now don't let that shock you. But Peter was already saved. He, I believe this is when Peter and Andrew actually become New Testament Christians. Now, the difference is, and this is why people get things confused, is when you have John the Baptist baptizing people, they were repenting of their sins, placing their faith in the Messiah that was coming. Is that not salvation? Yes. That's what they did all through the Old Testament. They put their faith 
in the promise, in the word of God, that the Messiah was coming as God promised and their faith was in him. They had no idea who he was though. And that's why you see that when they were down, they were clear down south, uh, almost to the Dead Sea, and that's where John was baptizing, and they were down there. They were disciples of John the Baptist. To be a disciple of John the Baptist, you, you, would, you would have to have been saved. Okay? And they're following him. Now, they live clear up north in Galilee, but they're all the way almost down to the Dead Sea uh, when this is taking place. And so they're following John the Baptist as disciples saved. Their faith was in the Messiah that was coming. But then as, as John the Baptist points out and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And they say, Wow! Who is this? He points out Jesus, and the first thing Andrew does is Andrew goes and finds Peter. I don't know, he may have been downtown. He may have been out here by the river, he may, whatever he was doing. But he was around because he was disciple of John. And so Andrew finds Peter, his brother, and brings him to Jesus. And as Jesus speaks to him here and changes his name and all of this, he realizes that this is, in fact, the one that he had been believing in. That it was Jesus that was the Messiah, the Christ. So he was already saved, but he simply brought him to Jesus recognizing that he was the Messiah, he believed in him, which now makes him a New Testament Christian. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> but it kind of throws out a lot of the stuff that we hear preached, don't it? Because, you know, preachers, I'm, I'm not going to say they're, they're being dishonest, but uh, they don't give the whole story when they're, when they're, they're using verses. Yes, we ought to bring people to Jesus, but that's, he, was already, he was already saved. Now, places where they were, that means a lot. Because uh, as you'll find out, uh, go to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, I have people preach this, that this is where uh, they became uh, apostles. And it's not. This is when, this is months later, after they had acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah, down towards the, the Dead Sea. They've gone back home up to Galilee. And months later, now we come to Mark chapter 1 and verses, verse 16, and it says, uh, now, as he walked on the Sea of Galilee, so you see the difference where they're at, the locations where they're at. He saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him, and when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who, were, who also were in a ship mending their necks. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after them. So at this point, Jesus approaches these guys they're up there in Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee, and they're fishing. And when he, when, when he comes and he sees them, they're mending their nets and stuff. And that's where he calls them to be his disciple. Not to be an apostle. To be an, a, a, a disciple. You have to be a disciple before you could ever be an apostle. So they immediately left everything that they had 
And they went with Jesus, training so that they could train to be fishers of men, men of God. We, do, we hear that all the time in our new, new day and age when we have like a mission conference and, and they're preaching and a young man or young lady comes forward and says, I want to surrender to full-time service. And then they do what? Do they just go out and start a church or something and go to the mission field? No. They go train for the ministry. They go to Bible college. It's the same thing. They're not going in as an apostle right now. That's later down the road. They're simply surrendering and immediately they're following Jesus and they leave their nets just like they would leave their family here and they would go down to a Bible college and begin to study for the ministry, trained to be fishers of men. Okay? Now, don't confuse this. Call for discipleship with later on becoming an apostle. Because look in Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. Okay, now, now tell me, where were they when Jesus just called them? And the, on the Sea of Galilee. Look what verse 13 says. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would and they came unto him and he ordained 12 that they should be with him that he might send them forth uh, to preach. Uh, they were obedient at once to answer the call of the master to discipleship they left all, they followed Jesus, they went to Bible college, and now Jesus calls them to be an apostle. Okay, so you have three different places, three different locations, three different time periods. You have many of the same people involved, but many people get them confused and they'll use verses here and there, and that's not what they're saying. So when they became New Testament Christians was down there uh, when J uh, uh, Jesus was, or when John the Baptist was baptizing uh, near Bethabara. Then when he calls them to be disciples, they're on the seashore there of Galilee. Then later on, after they had been disciples for a while, Jesus calls them all up to, all his disciples up to the mountain. And there on the mountain, he calls 12 to become his apostles. So it begins to kind of sort some things out as you go along with this. Now, some believe Peter was about 12, 15 years older than Jesus. Not that it makes a whole lot of difference there. But uh, we know that Peter was married before he became an apostle, but there's no mention that Peter ever had children. Uh, there is all kinds of traditions and things that people throw in here, and, uh, and it's just, it's bogus. There's nothing that they can prove with any of that. So now let's go to number two. Peter, the apostle, from the time his call uh, as an apostle there to the ascension uh, then of Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter's called to be an apostle. We just read that in, in, in Mark or uh, chapter 3 or Matthew chapter 10, Luke. It's in all of them where he calls him to be an apostle. But Peter was called Simon. That's, what he was, that's his birth name. That's what his father gave him. But Jesus changes his name to Cephas, which, if you understand this, Peter is Greek. That's the Greek form. And Aramaic is the word Cephas. So it's just the same name, but different languages. And you don't understand, you, you probably don't aren't a, a, a confronted with any of this, but when we go to the mission field, 
uh, you might call something the same thing and, and it's not the same thing. I remember when I went, in, went to Spain and I went into this little restaurant and boy, I mean, I, I knew Spanish. Uh, Dame dos tacos. Give me two tacos. And the guy started laughing at me. I said, well, did I say something wrong? <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, you said, dame dos tacos. Give me two tacos. I said, yeah. I mean, I've been to Taco Bell, right? Every time I went in and said, give me two tacos, they brought me two tacos. You know them little plastic things that you're going to put a picture up on the wall, you drill a hole and put that plastic piece in and then you screw something? That is a taco in Spanish or in Spain. So when you get places, diff different names are different. And in, here in the Greek, it's Peter, it's, it's Peter but in, in the Aramaic that was spoken, it was Cephas. So when he's using these, sometimes he's using the same word and, and, and just depends on how they translated it. But then Peter or Cephas means a small rock or a stone. Uh, we always say that God changed Peter's name. I think God, uh, I think Jesus changed the names of several apostles. And that's why when you see the lists of the apostles that he called, you have uh, Bartholomew, uh, you have another one, uh, uh, son of Alphaeus, you have all kinds of different terms, same people, but different names. And some may be a nickname, some may, you know, he could have said the sons of thunder, he could, all of this, but they use these names uh, somewhat interchangeable and, and so don't get confused with, with some of the names and everything. When he used the term Peter as a small stone, I don't think it was any accident. Uh, I think the, it wasn't the rock of ages. It wasn't the rock like Jesus is the rock. He is the cornerstone. He's the foundation but Peter was that small stone. He was just like a brick in the wall. I think Jesus was trying to show Peter what he should be. Now, it's a reminder to Peter whenever he heard that name. It, it's, he's not supposed to be the carnal Simon, but he's to be the spiritual Peter. Jesus was making him a rock, but constantly Peter is slipping back into that fleshly uh, Simon. So we do this all the time. We, we, we get spiritual for a little bit. We're Peter, we're that rock. But all of a sudden we find out we've slipped back in to that old life. We've slipped back into who I was before I got saved. Now, Christ changes us. Uh, it's interesting, the Africans, when you get saved, and I've had the privilege of giving many Africans their name. They have African names, but... When they get saved, they take on a Christian name. And so several of them, several Muslims, you know, Joshua and Elijah, and we've given them all kinds of names and everything. And that's what their name is from there on out. So many times when you see some of these names in, in Africa, you say, well, that's, a, that's an American type name. No, it's a biblical name uh, that they choose. Uh, he, Peter was like us, like most of us. He was both carnal and yet he was spiritual. And I don't know about you, but I can relate to Peter. He sometimes yielded the flesh and other times he really functioned uh, directed by the Spirit of God in his life. He, the, he, he was vacillating 
Yet he, I believe, was the leader of the apostles. Not the Pope, but he led the apostles. I don't think there's any doubt in that. Uh, other than Jesus, Simon, Peter, and Paul are mentioned most in the New Testament. Obviously, Jesus is the prominent figure throughout the, the entire Bible. But uh, it's interesting, Peter is mentioned 159 times in the New Testament. Paul is mentioned 159 times in the New Testament. Both of them are leaders in their field and are leading one for Jews and one for Gentiles. But it, it's interesting when you start studying these things out, just how equal both of them were in their ministries. Notice uh, Peter's life. From his calling to Christ, uh, ascension was a time of learning. It was a time of growing. It was a time of failing. And it was a time of trying again. This is one of the things that I really have grasped about Peter in studying this. He is so much like us. Uh, we, we like throw rocks at Peter for sticking his foot in his mouth and stuff like that. But as you, as you look at Peter, he's, he's constantly learning. Constantly learning. I was reading the, the devotion for the, uh, the church the way we were reading, reading through the other day. And one of the things that I noticed is Jesus, when he's standing there being tried, being mocked, being falsely accused, no doubt slapped around and roughed up and everything, he still takes the time after Peter has denied him three times to turn around and look out the window directly at Peter. And it says, and when he did that, Peter went out and wept bitterly. What was he doing? He was still teaching Peter even during his, his, not at that point was crucifixion, but at the accusations and the trials and everything. He's still teaching. It don't make any difference what point in our life. Now, most of us are getting older and dirt, but, you know, God's still working in our life. He's not done with it. And too often, as we get older, we think, well, you know, it's time to kind of give up and let the young folks. No, it's not. It's not. We're constantly learning. We're constantly growing. We're constantly failing. Any of you not failed before? <laughs> we could all write books. But we got to get up and try again. And that's what Peter did. Now, now notice, when Peter was called, he was called from something. And he was called to something. He was called from his fishing business. And he was called to become a fisher of men. What have you been called from? I was... I was in the military. I was making it a career. I'd been in eight years. I, I was making rate, going right up the line. I'd have been retired, man, 30 years ago. But when God called me, he called me from that life. And he called me to a different life. Now, it didn't, you don't have to be called to the mission field. But when you got saved, he called you from something. And he called you to something else. What did he call you from? And what did he call you to? It's interesting to note that in the list of the 12 apostles, Peter is always first in the list. And Judas is always last in the list. Now, the others 
depending on which uh, author you're reading, uh, they mix up the names. One may be third in the list in this one and fourth in the list in this one or, or sixth in the list here and eight in the list here. And, and they're, they're, they're not the same. But, they're, but Peter and, and Judas are always uh, first and last in those lists. Peter saw absolutely incredible highs in his, in his ministry. He also had incredible lows. When Jesus asked Peter who he thought Jesus was, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then later on, he denied that he even knew Jesus. He walked on water, showing his faith. But then as he turned his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. Can you imagine that? I mean, you got water out here and you're in a boat. And I mean, it had been pretty rough. Still was. And he said, Jesus bid me to come to thee. First of all, that would not have crossed my mind. But it did Peter. And Jesus says, come on. No way am I stepping in that water. Because it's only one way down. I've done that before. And I went down. To experience the, what Peter experienced literally walking on water. Now, yeah, he stuck his foot in his mouth before. But the highs, the experiences that he had were absolutely tremendous. Yet, he took his eyes off Jesus. He was one of the, thir uh, the, the three apostles on the mount that saw the transfiguration of Jesus. And then like a teenager, he put his foot in his mouth. Oh, I got to say something. And that like a teenager, they just have to say something. And you say, that was dumb. What did you even say that for? But they feel like they've got to prove themselves. They have to say something. That's kind of like Peter was. Put his foot in his mouth. He no doubt prayed in the garden. But later, he went to sleep. And Jesus says, can't you even pray with me for one hour? He accompanied Jesus in the garden. And yet, just a few moments later, he tried to cut off the ear of Malachus. He boasted of his loyalty. I'll never leave you. I'll never, uh-uh. But yet, just a little bit after that, he denied him three times. Peter. After the death of Christ, Peter went back fishing. Took the rest of them, led them in the wrong direction. Jesus said, he wants you to stay back here. Peter took them fishing. And that's when Jesus confronts him on the shore and says, Lovest thou me more than these? And not just once, but over and over. And I think God really worked on Peter's heart about this question of love the love question and I think that's why over and over we need to ask ourselves do I really love God as much as I want people to believe do I really love him do, have you really settled that question from this point out in Peter's ministry his ministry totally changed. 
But God continued to work with Peter over and over. And then right after that, you have the ascension. After the death of Christ, and he went back fishing, the Lord came to him. He confirmed Peter's calling. Jesus called Peter to settle that love question once for all. Lovest thou me? But then Peter saw the Lord's ascension. Watched him literally start floating in the air. And heading, there he went. <laughs> and just heading right on up to heaven. And turned around and says, fellas, we have to fulfill this prophecy. Now, wait a minute. Stop and think with me. If Jesus would stop in the middle of his trial to look at Peter to teach him a lesson, if while he is on the cross suffering, and look at John and say, John, there's something you need to take care of. I want you to take care of mom. When Jesus is ascending, if he wanted Judas replaced, don't you think he would have said, Matthias, I want you to take his place. But he didn't. Why? Because Paul wasn't ready. And Jesus wasn't ready to, to have that other apostle. Just like over and over, Peter jumped the gun. And it, it changed so much. I, I don't know about you. I can relate to Peter. I really can. Because with all his failures and with all his mistakes... Peter allowed Jesus to change his life. You, you look at some of us, you know, pastors and, and evangelists, missionaries, and you think, well, boy, you guys are super saints. You have no idea where we've come from. I mean, it would burn your ears. You, you can't imagine the things that God has taken us from. And when we first got saved, how, how dumb we were. But we did what, we, what Peter did. We allowed Jesus Christ to change us. Change, and, and that's why when, when I went back to a re reunion one day, they were absolutely shocked that they were absolutely shocked that this thing quit. What, what's happening here? There we go. When they found out that I was a missionary. Because in, in, in high school, I, every corner was on two wheels. I mean, as fast as we, we'd go, we'd do donuts down Main Street in the wintertime when it's snowing. I mean, it, it's crazy. See how far you could jump a car over the railroad tracks, over the medium and everything, and, and nose them in. God changed us from just purity old drunks to preaching the Word of God. I thank God my children don't know that stuff. I, th I, I, I listen to them, and, and I think, boy, so... They're kind of naive. They don't even know the definition of that. And I'm thinking, yes, what a blessing. But God changed Peter. And God changed me and God changed you with all his failures, all his mistakes. I think that's the secret of, of becoming a child of God, becoming a disciple, is to allow God to change you into becoming his servant. Allow Jesus to change you. Don't, don't waller in your mistakes. No pig goes out there and just wallers in the mud. And you go clean him up and he goes right back to that mud hole and he wallers again. 
Look, you made a mistake. Okay, you've made a mistake. Confess it. And get out of it. Don't go back to the mud hole. Don't wallow in your mistake and say, Oh, I'm just such an old wicked sinner. Well, you are. But get over it. He's forgiven you. He wants to use you for his glory. And if you keep, if you just keep, oh, I can't do this and I can't do this and I can't do, well, some things you can't, but you can still do a whole lot of others. God still wants to use you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to, to do something with your life. And as long as you've got breath, you ought to do what Peter did. Let God change you and use you again. Don't, don't worry about your failures. Don't worry about your mistakes. We've all made them, and some of us a whole lot more than others. But God wants to use us, and he can if we'll just let him. Now, Peter, the apostle from Christ's ascension to his death, he was the leader and primary preacher on, on the day of Pentecost. If you'll, always, if you'll notice Peter's life, usually he takes the lead. Some people, God has given that, that character to take the lead. Sometimes they're forced into it. I am not a leader. But because of what God called me to do, I had to become a leader. I'd rather everybody else do their thing. I'd just rather shut up and sit back and listen. You say, huh, you? Yeah. I, I, I'd just be fine if you just let me out in the woods and just nobody else around and I just all by myself. I like working by myself. That's why I do stupid things like get on ladders and stuff like that when mama's not looking. But don't, don't just stop your life because you've made mistakes. God wants to use you. He became that leader. God used Peter and John when he healed that lame man in the temple, just walking along. Uh, a lot of what you do, you would be surprised. How many of you just really are encouraged every time you see Miss Betty come to the, and sit, sit there in that chair? Of all people that have an excuse to stay home, she comes. Now, she's not well, pray for. But that encourages me. More than one of these teenagers coming to church. Now, that encourages me too, but not as much as that. You are not finished. God is not done with you. And the older you get, the more wisdom you obtain and more experience you begin to know about God and how he's worked in your life. And the more you need to share that with other people. Don't, don't be so quiet that you never give your testimony and let, let people know how God has blessed you. I would never, I would never have, have suspected <laughs> all that you have went through with that cancer and everything. And, and what a blessing it is to hear their testimony. But some of you got the same experiences, but you're just not sharing it with nobody. God wants to use that experience for his glory. And let God, people say, I've had three people come up to me this morning and say, what's wrong with your face? I said, look, I was born this way. What's your excuse? I got some cancerous stuff going on and they put this cream on and it's burning like fire. And he said, he said you're going to hate me because it's going to burn, it's going to turn red and it's going to make you ugly. I said, well, I've been dealing with ugly for 74 years. I think I can handle the red. Look, just get over yourself. God wants to use you. And so go ahead and just let God, don't dwell, don't waller in your self-pity and all the different things. Well, poor me, God can't use me. No, he can use you. Peter used the gift of discernment 
to expose the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. God gave him a special gift for that. When arrested for preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was Peter that spoke up on behalf of the apostles. Take the lead once in a while and speak up on behalf of your, of your peers and, and, and your, your, folk, your friends. Take the lead a little bit and say, hey, wait a minute. This is what's going on here. And he continued to preach until his death. He said, it's better to obey God than men. Out there in this world, I guarantee you, if you go anywhere, you can stand up for Jesus Christ and make him known. Peter and John were trusted to be sent to Samaria to see and acknowledge what God was doing among the Gentiles. Not to take over the Gentile ministry as the Catholics teach but to acknowledge that, yes, God was saving the Gentiles. He was saving the Samaritans. Peter received the vision from the Lord that was used to teach him that God, what God had cleansed, man should not put us under. So God had cleansed the Jews and the Gentiles and the Samaritans. The gospel was for everybody. God used Peter to acknowledge that. He acknowledged that Peter and James accepted and acknowledged the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles when he was around the rest of the people. He testified on behalf of Paul and the Gentile ministry he had. Now, Peter wrote two different epistles, one to the dispersion of the Jews uh, in the area around Asia Minor. It was written about 64 AD to encourage the Christians to become faithful and remain faithful in the suffering and trials. And Second Peter, he wrote that, a general epistle around 67 AD to warn of the threatening apostasy. Now, conclusion. Let's finish this up. What do we learn from Peter? Well, through many trials and faults, and failures, Peter grew in one of the greatest Christians in the New Testament. He was a leader, but never a pope. Never the first pope of Rome or anywhere else. It's written of Peter that he, his life ended as Jesus had predicted in John chapter 21. Nothing is ever said that he died upside down Nothing is ever said that he died on a crooked cross. Uh, all the different things that they said. There's nothing outside of this Eusebius. Which was a Catholic priest. That was biased. This rash, bold, self-centered man. Become a giant for God. Who was filled with the spirit of God. And was a humble and faithful servant until his death. My failure or foolish acts do not make me a failure. Yes, I've made mistakes, but that don't make me a failure. God still wants to use me. Peter was a wonderful example and encouragement to us that yes, you can fail, but yes, you can become great for God. And number three, I can get up get right, and become a giant for God. Any one of us can. What's the difference? Peter let God use him. That's the only difference. Whether you let God use you, he can make you into anything he wants to be. God still wants to use me. And he used Peter in a great way. May we pray? Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for the study on Peter and the things we've learned and the challenges that have been given. I ask God that you'd bless in the hour to follow. Lord, speak through your servant. Speak to our hearts. Change us. Use us for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Take a break.